it would be very nice if you could introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you are doing, and what your background is, where you come yes. from. Yes, I am Mother Agnes uh, Mariam of the Cross. Uh, I am born in Lebanon, in Beirut, from a Palestinian father. He was, uh, in reality, a displaced person with his family from uh, Palestine. And uh, a Lebanese mother, I lived in Beirut. And uh, I made also my own revolution, becoming a hippie for a few years. And then I was converted to Christ and I entered in uh, a very strict monastery called the Carmel, here in Lebanon, in Harissa. And during the civil war I was uh, very much uh, striken by the fate of uh, the Christian in Middle East. Uh, it was the beginning of my conversion because now I am striken by the fate of all the people in the Middle East. And um, I also discovered uh, the reality of the Church of Antioch, my native church. So I asked uh, to be more inserted in the local church and to found a monastery. I wanted to found here in Lebanon, but uh, the providence made me go to, uh, to Syria where I discovered the ruin of a beautiful monastery of the 6th century. It's Maria Kub, St. James the Mutilated Monastery in Kara, Syria. We began, we made an agreement with the bishop and uh, we began the work, the restoration works in uh, 1994. And in 2000, uh, the bishop founded a community, monastical community. Uh, then uh, we had also another foundation for monks and today we are a community of 15 members with uh, 15. yes 15 uh, with uh, eight nationalities uh, we are uh, in this monastery in the beginning uh, before the events we were open to spiritual uh, hospitality uh, to cultural uh, interaction and also of course for dialogue and prayer contemplation meditation but uh, during the events uh, you know we were called uh, to be more responsive to the situation so we, we made uh, mediation for the liberation of uh, uh, people that were in jails or abducted or kidnapped then we made the humanitarian uh, services to all the population and uh, we were also uh, called to give our witnesses witnessing about what is happening in Syria. It resulted a problem because what we saw was not conform with what the international media were reporting. So and since then it was, you know, a new call for us to bear witnessing and we are very proud that uh, what is today uh, very well known everywhere so, uh, were reported by us for the first time in November 2011. I, I'll come to this. Uh, so you, are, you were in Syria, now you're going back and forth yes. because of doing social work. Yes. Uh, you spoke up quite early that some things might not be as they are uh, presented in the Western world in 2011. Yes. Uh, please tell us what you saw was different from what you were reading when you went yes. to France or wherever. You know, <coughs> when you uh, reside in a place, you don't rely only on what you hear or what you see in the media. You have a more direct uh, means uh, to uh, sense the reality. It's your own eyes and also dealing with people that are immersed in those realities. So as a monastery we have a big network of friends, of parents, uh, also of partners all over Syria, especially in Dara, in Damascus, in Homs, in Aleppo, and even the Jazeera. So uh, what we saw in the beginning in the media was a kind of binary world. From one part 
the peaceful demonstrations with uh, beautiful titles, completely, you know, uh, like uh, angels. And on the other side, the, the dark side, uh, the repression of this terrible regime, uh, who suddenly, yes, who's a te uh, who suddenly, you know, uh, was getting known as if before all those uh, countries that were dealing with uh, this regime didn't know what he was in reality. Uh, now, uh, on the ground, we begin to, f to see that uh, what was related in the, me in the media was completely false. I will give you a small example. Uh, one day, the Jazeera said that Abbasid Square was completely invaded by a 100,000 demonstration. So we called our family, the family of our worker, uh, living in the Abbasid Square. They said, what? 100,000 demonstrators? There is nobody. I said, but it's not possible. You look. We are seeing it on the television. They said, there is nobody. And after a while, we saw on the Syrian television a direct link with the Abbasid Square, which was empty. And we could also see the scene in Al Jazeera on the Abbasid Square, which was full. So this is, you know, a kind of uh, challenging with the media world that could pass to you virtual scenes and the reality you are living. Another time, uh, going to Damascus, I saw in the morning reports in Al Jazeera uh, saying that a village in the neighborhood of Damascus, Jdaidat Artuz, was being surrounded by army tanks and with a lot of injured people. They were, you know, targeting the population and they had many wounded and even killed people. So uh, arriving to Damascus in the patriarch, uh, on the patriarch uh, uh, table, because we were invited to lunch, I met the priest of this village. So I gave him my condolences, telling him, real fa really, Father, I regret what is happening, what kind of situation is this? So he looked at me with big eyes, he said, what are you saying? I said, well, uh, you have many dead people. Uh, I wonder why you are here, how could you come? He said, but why should I, shouldn't I come? I said, but you are surrounded by tanks. He said, who told you? I said, Al Jazeera. He said, you are still hearing and looking in such a garbage. So uh, in reality, there, is, there was nothing of this. It was also a mounted, you know, scenario. So we had like this many, many, every day, every day, every day. The reality was an oriented propaganda reality uh, or uh, propaganda media, you know, um, uh, media output. But uh, the reality was diverse, was, was different. So uh, this, you know, uh, led us to do something. And uh, the best we could do was to invite uh, foreign reporters to come and see with their own eyes. So we were the first, our, me, our team, our uh, media team was the first to report uh, that the reality on the ground was not like the media was tell were telling. What, what made you feel responsible to tell the people, you know, that there is something going on? Well, because you had victims. Uh, because with this, this um, way of uh, hiding the reality of the events, they were hiding the reality of the aggression of civilian population and also of security forces. You know, out of combat, it was a mere uh, aggression. So this aggression 
was not reported, was not covered, and so the victims were not protected. So we felt that we had to draw the attention of the world to, to those uh, actions on the ground that were not reported and that were violent and threatening the life of innocent. So what you are saying is that the West has reported things which never ever happened? Yes. In the beginning? Yes. And going on the next few months, or next year and a half, it was escalating. That's what you told us earlier, right? Yes. Uh, maybe you could just describe how this entire thing went on, what, what you were witnessing and your... Yes, were witnessing. you know, what we are now concluding, because we can look in uh, the past and make a lecture, because uh, we have, uh, if you want, uh, the benefit of distance, you can see. Uh, there was an infiltration of Asians, of, uh, you know, armed Asians, inside Syria, who had to implement like centers uh, of offensive uh, war. And uh, they had to cover this until it will be well implemented. So the first step of the media coverage was one-sided and they had also to justify the implementation of those armed gangs. So to justify them, they had to uh, show to the public opinion that every day you had injured people, repressed, uh, peaceful demonstrators that were killed out of nothing uh, by the regime. And like this, until today, even though you see horrible things that cannot be justified because you can kill someone but why should you cut him in pieces you can kill someone but why uh, should you for example put him on fire or, or why should you rape him or okay so you have you have many things that are uh, unjustified and they are still justifying them with this first story saying you know it was peaceful but then the deeds of the regime repressing the peaceful population wanting democracy and freedom uh, put pressure and you know invoked the presence of more and more uh, uh, extremism more and more uh, violence so it's a propaganda but uh, very wise you know uh, in a wise like way uh, to prepare the ground uh, to make the world accept what is not acceptable. And uh, for us, all this is not the first time that is happening. Myself, <coughs> I am a victim of uh, such international interference or s international coverage of uh, injustice. My father is a displaced Palestinian coming from Nazareth in 48 and he never uh, have been able to come back with his family and myself uh, without uh, uh, before having my French passport I could not go and visit my family in Nazareth another thing excuse me another thing is that uh, after the, the Nakba after 48 we passed by a lot of turbulences and we are still passing by a lot of turbulences in Orient. And the international community is not pushing toward peace, is not pushing toward security for the more uh, uh, fragile, for the weaker, weaker among the population. So uh, it's time, I think, to talk, to speak, and to stigmatize those methods because those methods even though there is some occult benefit uh, are unlawful methods they are against international laws and they are against humanitarian international laws 
So what do you think is the bigger force behind all this? Force. The bigger power or, you know, what is the big plan? I, th I think that uh, behind this there is the world system. Uh, the world system that raised after the two world wars, where um, you have uh, a pole uh, which has in its hand uh, mo most of the resources of the planet. Uh, you have the financial re resources, the industrial resources, the military resources, and uh, also the cultural and the humanitarian resources. And uh, this system is globalizing, is globalized. It means that uh, you go to the United Nations, it's not uh, free, it's not independent. It is under the system. If you go to the media, they are not free. They are inside in the frame of the system. You go to the banking uh, world, it is under the system. Everything today is entering in an era of globalization, which is good from one side because you have a kind of pyramid, you have a kind of hierarchy, and maybe one sole or restrict responsibility, so it's good for coordination. But on the other hand, if it is unlawful, it is a terrible way of repression for the whole mankind. Okay? So that's what we feel. We are, uh, you know, um, we are witnessing the emergence, the emergence, you know, the coming, the emergence. The emer the, the, we are witnessing the emergence of a new system that is justifying itself with good titles, you know. What is this? Like globalization, like, um, you know, uh, the new world order. It's, in one way, as I tell you, it can be very benefit, you know, like the internet is something very good. But if, uh, if it is a mean of infiltrating you, of uh, watching you, and uh, of uh, <coughs> limiting your, your freedom, it can become terrible mean of repression. So, you say that Syria, the conflicts we have in Syria, are some kind of manifestation of what you are just saying? Yes. So, can you please describe? Look, uh, uh, Syria, the system, the ruling system in Syria, is not coming from heaven. The ruling system, what is this? Maybe if you want, you can close. Yes, I suggest. And so it won't give uh, this. Is it copied? It copied. Yeah. It is copied yes. as far as I can see. Yeah, so just close it up. No, if you close it, you wait a little bit and you can take it off. You wait. Yes. I don't know why it doesn't close. But now it will close. Thank you. Okay. So, so what were <coughs> manifestation? How does all this, you know, what you were just describing? You know, the you, you can take it off. You take you can take it off. Yes, you can take it off. Thank you. The the ruling system in Syria is not coming down from heaven. We have been experiencing it in Lebanon during the war. And we have many people that are disappeared, have disappeared in the jail of the Syrian regime. So as Lebanese, I can assure you that we don't have a sympathy for such a ideology. Now, I have been living in Syria for 18 years. I haven't seen only black things. I have also seen good things. For example, a socialist implementation of partnership in resources, 
that make the state being able to give free of charge education, hospitals, uh, low, low cost food and pharmacy to everybody and even good sharing of land for agriculture and very good support in all kind of life necessities. Of course in any system and I would say even a, the kingdom of God you will have people that are against. So the freedom is to leave them express themselves and take the democratical means to implement their position and open a door for their new system. In Syria it was not really possible because this ideology is national nationalistic and any kind of opposition would be considered as a threat to the state security. So, of course, that in Syria it was necessary to make a shift toward freedom, toward democracy, and all those values that the Western world have been uh, struggling for during decades, like, you know, the French Revolution. I won't enter in all this because I am not an expert. But I, I understand that in Syria people would be fed up of having always to hear the same ideology and to be obliged to think and to talk the, the way, you know, the, the government would. But we felt that during this Arab Spring, those principles or those rights have been hijacked because they, they were, you know, very well covered and very well supported by the international community and all its media uh, machine. But slowly by slowly, and no, I would say very quickly, in few months, it became an Islamic, an Islamist call, an Islamist uh, project. And when you say an Islamist project, it's a sectarian project, it's a project that is for one part of the population and not for the other, and so it is biased. But nevertheless, it continued to be covered and supported as if it was in the same purity of expression as the first time. Now we have exacerbation, you know, extrem extremism of those premises like uh, it's not only islamic way where we uh, we will make our uh, demonstration coming out from the mosque it will be a friday we will say we will say it in an islamic way with our cultural and cultural you know way this is not a problem but when you say when you express that your aim is not democracy and is not freedom. What you want to implement is the Islamic Sharia. Now you have another project, you have another plan. So the media did not, you know, rely, did not, uh, did, 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 did not uh, transmit what the shift of this revolution in a way the public opinion would be really aware about what is happening because always always they they was someone uh, very well you know gifted to justify uh, the the hijacking to say no don't care uh, it is only a moment but nevertheless on the ground you know even though the international community would send a lot of help and a lot of very skilled people uh, to uh, frame uh, in the so-called liberated area, you know, the opposition, uh, the, the, the supportive environment of uh, the rebels, etc. They, I have been there, you know. It's, it's a scandal. 
what is the model, what is the sample they are trying to implement for the Syrian population. It's a betrayal. They are trying to give us, instead of an ideological regime, who was giving security and he w there were some benefits, you know, not only damages. Okay? Uh, they, they are trying to, to, to convince us that what is happening in Syria today is for the benefit of the Syrian population. I can tell you, I can tell you because I have been there, that 90% of the Syrian population is upset of what is happening. You know, in the liberated area they are upset. Unless they are families of those who are still benefiting, you know, with money or with possibility of infringing the laws through smuggling and uh, making all kinds, you know, of, uh, of businesses. All those who are making benefits, they are still, you know, uh, giving uh, their trust or uh, supporting this kind of revolution. But the, 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 whole, the whole Syrian people, the massive and uh, the majority of the Syrian people are really ruined, completely ruined, you know. And uh, let us see what are the achievements. Let us look, have a look on the Syrian ground. What are the achievements of two years and a half of so-called liberation, okay? All the infrastructure of the state have been completely destroyed. If you want to implement freedom and democracy, why should you destroy the electricity plant? Why should you destroy the gas canalization? Why should, why should you destroy the water treatment? Why should you destroy the cultural heritage? Why should you loot the museum? And why should you burn, you know, the Aleppo souks? Or why should you destroy uh, the Omayyad mosque, etc., etc.? And moreover, why should you infiltrate residential area against the will of the population? to transform residential areas, secure residential areas, into battleground. So you are calling a massive destruction because you made in the residential area a military battleground. So you have now the scenes uh, which are equivalent uh, to a Stalingrad or to a Dresden, uh, you know, scene like uh, this terrible destruction uh, of uh, the residential panorama in Syria. And this will mean, this mean, means today uh, hundreds of thousands, and the reality is that six million people are displaced inside, inside Syria. They have no shelter, or they have to seek an alternative shelter, and they have to be at assisted, while never, ever, since 50 years, the Syrian people were no more assisted.